Welcome everyone to this week's Industry Cast. Uh, this is where we go live at 11.30 every Wednesday to talk about technologies, talk about personal development, talk about different ways to uh, help our customers uh, be better at what they do, better at their craft. We want to always be adding value. That is our motto here at CapEx Sales. So today, super excited to have Michael Rabasco on. He is from Weber Screwdriving Systems. We're going to be talking about best practices for feeding and torquing of uh, screws. So this is something that he has been involved with in manufacturing. Uh, Michael, I'll, I'll let him tell you how long. I don't know if you want to disclose exactly how long that is, but uh, you can share with them some of your experience and also you know, share us uh, some about Weber and, and their footprint. Sure. Well, thanks for having me on today. I really appreciate it. Um, you and I had spoken earlier a couple of weeks ago and, you know, kind of laid out what it is that this whole webcast thing is about. And I was pretty excited about it. And my mind starts spinning. There's a whole lot of things we can talk about. We can talk about the way part, uh, customers make their parts, how they fixture their parts and, and, and how the things fit together and what kind of screws. And we could talk about torque and angle and depth and stuff. And this could take, you know, we could be on the phone all day here or on, on a webcast all day. But I said, you know what, let's just boil this down to something very, very simple today. And that's what we're going to go through. And that's um, the, the difference between blow feeding screws and doing it like a pick and place process, which we'll go through. But uh, thanks for having me. Um, my name is Mike Rabasco. I've been with Weber for a very long time. I had a lot of hair back when I started 30, <laughs> 30 37 years ago as a machinist uh, for the company and have grown with the company over time. Uh, Weber is a, is a German manufacturer, but we have a huge footprint here in North America. Uh, we're located in Mooresville, North Carolina. We have a sizable facility with a full shop and engineering staff. The projects that we take on here in North America are all engineered and supported through our facility in Mooresville, North Carolina. So we get base components from our factory but uh, we are the ones here in, uh, in, in North America to engineer the solutions and support the solutions and so forth. Um, so it, it becomes, becomes very nice for us to be so close to our customers. We, have, we go through distribution through regional sales directors who are also very, very well trained on the equipment and processes that we have to offer. And that we also uh, filter down through independent reps. So that's how we go to market. But um, one of our favorite things to do is to leverage 100 plus years of fastening experience with our customers so that we can, uh, we can ensure their success. So one of, our, uh, one of our mission statements actually is to enable our customers for success. And we do that in various ways. It could be just giving them, uh, selling them a machine that works really well and lasts a long time, uh, but it can also be getting involved in projects early on to make sure that, that we're checking all the boxes so that we can have um, we can have success. And that's what a little bit about what this is all about here today. Yeah, for sure. So super excited to, to delve into this conversation about uh, best practices, specifically your experience with uh, the different feeding types. So let's just mm -hmm. go ahead and get and launch into this presentation. Uh, can you, we'll begin with obviously uh, to blow feed or not to blow feed, that is the question. That is an official uh, Michael Robasco comment there that is not to be credited to Shakespeare in any way, shape, or form. Uh, but That's right. I figure we have a little fun with that. You're going to explain to us uh, the two main methods. There's the blow feed and, and pick and place. So talk us through the advantages and disadvantages of each of these. Gotcha. Perfect. Okay. So what we have on the screen here are the two basic spindles that you would normally see on the end of a robot or an end of a gantry or, for, or on a machine to put screws in something. And one on the left is a blow feed system. We'll go through that. And the one on the right is a, is a pick and place. The big difference here is the one on the left, you go, the nose piece gets real close to the part generally, the bit comes out, it drives the screw into the part. And the interesting thing about our design is the next screw is actually on its way there so that when you're done driving the screw, you're ready to go again. Very fast, very efficient, flexible, uh, the tubing is flexible. The cables are flexible. You can put them on a six axis robot. You can drive upside down. You can drive vertical. You can drive any, any direction you want. Just a good, just a good, good solid way to go. What would the, spin so me, I, I want to ask a question there, Michael, sorry to interrupt. But what is the right. max speed that you could achieve for say a, a half inch long screw in that blow feed application? 
Um, it really depends on the number of factors. I mean, you can get the motor to, to spin as, as, you know, almost as fast as you want. In some plastics applications, there are limits on how fast you can rotate the screw because there's heat mm -hmm. generation and that sort of thing. But I would, I would say in general with that system, you're looking at cycle times sub three seconds easily. And that system on the left there, that blow and feed, we, we can do up to 75 screws per minute. In other words, on a dial indexer or a walking beam system, um, something that's very repetitive, we, can, we have cycle times way sub one second to put a screw in. And that means not only putting the screw in, but putting another screw in and a half a second under that. Wow. The system on the right, not so much. That's a pick and place. Oh, and so that is, um, and it, there's nothing wrong with the pick and place, but it does have its limitations, but it also has its areas where it excels. The pick and place is where the driver has to go get a screw, and then the driver has, has to be moved over to the part to drive the screw. And it's- well, So um, that's suck instead of blow. Yeah, it, for cycle time, it certainly does, that's for sure. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it. We're very successful with vacuum. it. I guess my question is that's vacuum, right? So you're, yeah, yeah. it is vacuum. Or well, mag it, is it magnet? Do you ever use a magnet in that case? Uh, it can be magnet. Um, a magnet, you know, we, there's a place and a time for magnets, but, and it can be magnet, but uh, the problem with the magnet is generally you can't shut it off. So you get a screw on there, the screw is crooked. Now what do you do with it? At least with the vacuum, you can get rid of it. The other thing is vacuum, you can detect vacuum. So if we go to a pick and place and pick a screw up, we can actually measure the amount of vacuum pull that we have. And if the screw were to fall off for some reason, we're not gonna come down into the part with a piece of tooling that doesn't have a screw on the end of it. So there are some advantages in that regard, for sure. But the downside of that is that, of course, the spindle has to move, right, for sure. Um, you have to, has to be placed over the feeding unit and then go over to, to the part that you want to drive the screw. And that takes time and that can be complicated. Yeah. Um, and it's really mostly a cycle time thing. Uh, also really, really long screws don't really play well with that kind of technology because the, you know, if the screw is just a little bit crooked, a half a degree, by the time you compound that over a three inch long screw, that's almost always a recipe for disaster for picking a screw up with vacuum the head has to be a certain shape. And we, maybe we'll have another one of these CapEx things where I can explain the different types of head shapes that are conducive for vacuum. They're not all good for vacuum. Sometimes sure. a screw with a rounded head doesn't really have anything for us to pick up on that's solid enough to keep the screw straight. So it has its limitations, but it also has its places. It has its places where um, maybe the screw is really down into the part real deep and you have a ton of cycle time and there's a robot on the machine anyway. And it's just the right thing to do. Um, a lot of our customers still use pick and place. Um, one of the things that we're going to expose in this series here is why some applications have to have a pick and place, which isn't always the best solution. So that's a little bit what we're going to go through towards the end of this, uh, this thing. So what we have here is a pick and place um, dead nest. Just a couple of quick pictures. Um, the, screw, the, the, the pictures in here are just showing you what a dead nest looks like. Now, feeding really, really short screws or that can't be blow fed, which is where we're going with this, or any screw for that matter, is it's just the same. You're either going to release the screw and blow it down some tubing, or you're going to leave it into a dead nest, which is what these pictures are. And the dead nest is just going to kind of hang on to it there for, for, for as long as it needs to, until the robot comes over with the driver. Usually it's a robot, comes over with the driver, the bit extends, you have vacuum or magnetic, usually vacuum, and you're going to pick the screw up and you're going to go over to the part and you're going to drive it. Um, so, and then of course there's different methods for this where you might have to have a clamp underneath inside the, uh, the pick and place to hold the screw still from rotating while well, you do a finding routine and you find the engagement, which works very well. Again, adds a ton more cycle time and complexity to it. Um, so that's what a pick and place is. Okay. Yep. Ooh, ooh, ooh. That's all right. So <laughs> here's feed and drive. Feed and drive is much quicker. You can see the, um, the head on the left is, has that feed tube coming in from the left-hand side, that's round feed tube. And you'll see in, in the, on that center drawing there, you'll see the path that those blue arrows, that's the path that the screw takes from the, from the feed tube into the nose piece. Dang it. Yeah. And then uh, of course the picture to the right is where we just simply escape the screws into a piece of round tube and blow them over to the driver. One of the, uh, yeah, here you go. One of the unique things that we have here is what we call feed well drive. It's something that uh, 
Mr. Weber came up with years and years and years ago, and it's still to this day, um, the same methodology of getting the screw into the nose piece. And the advantage here is that um, while you're driving a screw, you can see in step one, that's the screw making its way to the nose piece. Step two is the bit advancing forward, pushing the screw out of the nose piece and successfully driving it into the part. Actually, that's probably three and four. And you see on step three, while we're forward, that link there, it's called the swivel arm, pushes out of the way, it's, it's spring loaded, and we're actually feeding the next screw. So there's, there's no way to get 60 screws a minute by driving a screw and then feeding a screw and then driving a screw and then feeding a screw. You have to do these things concurrently. So with this design, we can actually drive a screw and feed the next screw and have it really there waiting at the drive, almost at the driver bit, while you're driving the previous screw. This is how we get fast cycle times out of our equipment. As the bit retracts in step four, that screw just simply falls into the nose piece. What's the longest uh, line of tubing that you've ever had to run? Uh, I don't know about the, which one is the longest, but I know we have, we do a lot of what's called flow drilling, which is a whole separate process. It's a whole, we probably do a cap after just on that. <laughs> um, we call it RSF for flow drilling. And I know those are, we're putting all the, the Ford F-150s, 250s and 350s together with that technology, hundreds of, of systems. And uh, you can imagine, and it's putting the chassis together, putting the, um, excuse, putting the body together. And so you can imagine the, the, uh, the radius on the robots that they basically almost the size of the truck, getting inside the truck, inside the cab. And so those feed tubes have to be very long. And I believe they're, you know, they're, they're above 60 feet blowing a screw through tubing. Wow. You know, there's challenges with it for sure. You have to, the routing has to be right. You have to have the right hose. You have to have the right dress packs and so forth. Um, and then, of course, there's, you know, the laws of physics too. Listen, it takes right. X amount of time to get the, the screw from point, point A to point B. So these applications where I explain where we're doing, you know, 50, 60, 70 screws a minute, they don't have 30 feet of hose. I can tell you that. They got like six feet of hose, you know, because it does take a while to blow the screw over uh, to the driver. That's just nothing we can do about that. It only... It can only pick up so much velocity, right? But generally, the feed lines are 30 feet or less in a screw driving system. We, as technicians, we prefer less is better because it just uncomplicates. It's less less area for the screw to get stuck and you know the things to go wrong. But yeah, no, I'd say you're you're safe at, at 50, 60 feet to, to blow a screw easily. That is uh, that's a <laughs> that's a long distance. Well, it helps with a robotic cell because a lot of robotic cells are designed in such a way that they're caged in for safety. And to have the feeder close to the driver isn't practical because every time you have to go fill the bowl or service the feeder or do anything with it, you have to basically lock out and tag out the whole system. And then, of course, the whole assembly line stops at that point. So what this allows us to do is to put the feed systems in a favorable position, uh, location, I should say, so that yeah. people can get to them. So that's blow feeding, right? Is this the next slide here? It is indeed, yeah. Then, so that we talked so far that uh, that slide previously was showing you blowing a screw through round tubing. And yeah, then like a, there standard, are, a standard screw that would have right. an appropriate ratio, right? That's right, that's right. And that's where we're going actually with this is the ratio and, and how we get there. Um, and then, there, um, then there's screws that you can't blow feed through round tube. Uh, by the way, the round tube comes in a half a millimeter increments, so 20 thousandths increments in the, on the inside diameter. And there's two, base, there's two basic forms of that hose. There's this really thick, flexible hose we use generally for handheld stuff. And then there's the thinner, more slick stuff that we use for robotic applications. But this is another technology that we um, also have. And it's blow feeding screws and nuts, by the way, through profile tube. And this is just another way to do, another way to skin the cat. This is a solution for the guy who otherwise would have had to have gotten a pick in place because the screw is too short to blow through round tubing because it'll tumble and still get the screw to the driver through tubing. And so this is custom extruded tubing and um, it works It works well. We actually, we got two of them on the floor this week for, for a big automotive manufacturer. And, you know, we look at the screws objectively and we say, we ask them, can you change the screw to be a little bit longer? Can you do something to the screw so we can blow feed it? Because we're going to save you a lot of money. These machines are about 35% more expensive for a number of reasons, which we'll talk about. Um, and they say, nope, this is the screw. This is the part. 
you know, this is what we got to do. And this is our cycle time. So we say, okay, well, we can pick and place it. And it's going to take you five seconds to go get a screw. It's going to take you a couple seconds to put it in, but then the robot has to go back and forth and they go, no, 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 no. This is, this part's big. And by the time the robot goes back and we'll never make it, we'll have to get 10 machines. You can't do that. That's, it's impossible. Say, okay, here's our solution then. We can actually blow feed that screw, but um, you have to pay up. It's it's a much more expensive, much more complicated system. And it's a great system. It works really, really well. It's just, you know, we don't try to talk people out of it, but we do recommend that they take a close look at their design to make sure this is really one of what they want to do. They really want to spend this extra money for profile tubing. This profile tubing um, is made by a company um, that we've partnered with in Germany. We have looked high and low in throughout North America and Europe for a hose manufacturer that will make profile tube and everyone says they can do it. And I'm telling you, nobody can. I've mm-hmm. been looking for a hose supplier to, um, to have a second source for this stuff for years. And we found a bunch of them that say they can do it, but they really can't. And then by the time you get the hose in, you get the sample piece that you're looking for, it's horrendous. What's, um, it's, very, it's very difficult to make. The dye, the extrusion process to make this stuff yeah. is is somewhat complicated it's complicated to make in long lengths also because if you need a roll that's um 100 or 200 feet it has to be consistent all the way through and one bump on the interior and it doesn't work because the screw gets stuck so it becomes very very costly and complicated there's a if we don't have hose the hose that you need in that size in stock we have to actually pay a tooling charge up front to have the hosing the hose made sure and sure. a little bit long adds a little bit of lead time again with all of this it still works I and mean, you still sell a lot of these things it's just not the most ideal practice generally. what is uh what is sek and sem what are those acronyms the sek is is the, that spindle on the right um and that's that's what that's our basically if you look from that pink area above it's the same as the other two spindles i showed you but from that pink part south is all that complicated tooling to get the screw shuttled into the nose piece. That's what an SEK is. That's just our designation for this kind of a oh, driver. Okay. And the SEM is, the, as you can't tell the difference. It looks just like that. It's for nuts. It's the same thing. So if we, I should have probably put a slide in here showing a nut, but we also do nut driving the same way. And if you have, let's say, an M5 flange nut, you're going to get a hose that looks like this hose here. It's just that it'll have a rectangle profile on the inside. And it's other than that, it's the same technology. Is that what I sent There's you back. the other day? Oh yeah, it was, yeah, actually, yep, yeah. yeah, we do those all the time. So tell me, I, just uh, I know this isn't uh, the main part of this conversation, but these look, this looks so dang complicated. So right here, we've got the actual servo drive itself, right? Yep, that's the motor. That's right. And the little gear bo- That's a little gearbox here, I would assume. That's that's an industrial motor, an industrial size gearbox. This is not a handheld strapped yeah. onto the end of a driver that's that's um a design from us that works with our controllers which are specifically designed for our equipment that's the torque transducer that torque tells us transducer. everything we, okay. yep that tells us everything we need to know about how much torque is on the fastener mm-hmm. and degrees of angle rotation and in, in, in here is it is it all gearing uh, nope jabs? there's really oh well, you know what that is uh, just below that is what we call the bit stroke module and think of the bit stroke module as a, as a really high performance air cylinder with a really high performance axle through the center of it, precision axle that spins through the center of it so that it goes up and down and it rotates. And that's, that's really the, um, that's the main Weber product right there. It's our bit strokes. They come in various sizes of uh, uh, SAO3, which goes to three newton meters, and SA10, it goes to 10 newton meters. We have a 30 newton meter, we have a 60, we have a 100 newton meter, 150 newton meter. There is, there's all different sizes of that, but basically the, um, the technology is the same in all of them. It's an air cylinder, they come in different lengths, and it has a live axle through the center. So what that transducer is measuring is the actual force on that screw with almost no drag and no torque loss inside the spindle. That's our flagship that's how we make things happen is that bit stroke module. Very, okay. very important. A whole nother CapEx thing we can do is that little, I don't you really can't see it, but there's a blue sensor on there. It's a, uh, it's an analog depth sensor. That's other, that's, that's more technology that we use in conjunction with our C30 controller so that we know where the driver is in space at all times while driving the fastener. In other words, we know how deep the screw is. One of the, one of the biggest complaints we get from, from manufacturers are, we're getting what they call, quote, lifted screws, where screws are tight, 
but they're not in all the way. And that technology allows us to detect screws that are not actually in all the way. So that's we again, were literally a, last little week, off topic, but we were having that conversation with a customer last week. Uh, they they have a an application that they're doing for Ford, and mm -hmm. uh, every now and again they will have a lifted screw where that's it, right. it meets torque and angle, but it didn't get to depth. And that's right. So uh, of course, I immediately thought of your your systems as a, a potential uh, solution for their problem there. So. Yeah, I mean, it's been a, it, that's been a, an issue with manufacturing driving screws from the beginning of time, and that's that's why that design got made years ago. So we use it all the time. So here is the here's here's what the um, the SEK or the or the uh, um, the profile tube solution looks like in real life. So you'll see the picture all the way. Uh, to the left is you know, they march right down the track the same way a longer screw would. There's no issues there. Feeding them is really an, not an issue. They can go to that swivel escapement or they can go to a dead nest, dead nest just the same. They actually get swiveled down and you'll see that they get dropped into profile tubing. So you'll see the tubing that's vertical down is that tubing. Right. The next slide you'll see on the left side of that picture is where the profile tube enters the head. But there's a lot more going on here. You see um, that black box there. That's an amplifier for a photo cell. So we want to look across the jaws to make the sure the screw got there. Then what's kind of out of the picture a little bit is a pushing cylinder that pushes the fastener into the jaws. And of course, there's two sensors to tell you if, if, that, if that ram is retracted or advanced. And then there's a couple little air fittings on the front of it, which we blow air into occasionally. Nothing hooked up to it right now, but we blow air into those to keep the, the photo cell clean because it gets it gets dirty over time in production. So you can see, it, again, it's the other way to do it, but there's a lot more mechanics and that's why the machines are more money. Um, now you compare everything that I just explained here to the photo all the way to the right. Look how simple that is. You got a, you know, a round tube into a round hole into a round nose piece and off you go. So this is just trying to explain the complexity, the different complexity of having a, uh, a you know, a profile tube machine versus a machine which um, just uses round tubing that, um, you know, that it's is readily available. Not only the upfront cost, but it seems like the the maintenance cost long term would be a, a challenge and from a troubleshooting perspective it would be quite yeah a, it is this yeah a, i mean challenge. we design them in such a way that you know we you know we've been doing this so long it's the best way we can come up with it and and there is you're right though there is more there's more moving parts so it, there's nothing we can do about it it's the, it's the laws of physics right so more mm -hmm. stuff more stuff goes wrong uh, and if that wasn't enough um here this next slide shows you that uh, that hose is, can also get expensive um, at three hundred sixty-five dollars for three feet versus you know ten bucks a foot. So um, you know, again, not a showstopper. We sell these machines all the time. Like I said, we have two of these machines on the floor right now, um, going to a customer who is you know attaching a fan assembly onto 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 a motor. But you kind of wonder, like, if you were in that engineering office like six or eight months ago when they were engineering that part, if they would made the screw a little bit longer, they would have been in the ten dollar a foot feed tube, not the, you know, a hundred and something dollar a foot feed tube. And so that's, this is a little bit um, what we, you, you and I have talked about this before, where we Weber, we would like to share what we know about the solutions and not always possible way in advance. Like if you could just be a fly on the wall in the engineering department, when they're coming up with this stuff and listen, I get it. There are just some applications that just, they just have to have a short screw. The screw has to be 13 millimeters in diameter, and it can only be eight millimeters long. There's no way you're going to blow feed that through round tubing because that's just the way it is, right? Mm -hmm. um, but if we can have those conversations earlier, which is what we really enjoy doing, that's where we, we feel that we can leverage our knowledge and really help customers out. Sure. Help so the design for manufacturing. I, so I just exactly. did some math. Uh, that 60-foot run with the pricing that you had there would cost $7,300 just for the tubing. Yeah, run. it's, yeah. <laughs> it was a 60 foot run. And there isn't a huge markup on it. We just, we get tortured from, from this company. It just, it, it can, what is they also- Because it they works. Also, hey. It know, works, you know, it's not just because yeah, it's the only game. You got to pay for stuff that works. So That's let's, right. and let's we, talk about, you know, some of the challenges you can imagine. I I, I can imagine my, uh, is, is you're feeding these parts to them, them tumbling through this tube and then not ending up in a in a position to be torqued. 
Um, That's right. So this is um, this <laughs> this is kind of fun. Back in the olden days, you know, when we had we didn't even have digital calipers. We just had you know the one. I, some of the newer guys can't even read them. You know, the regular caliper with the lines on it, right? We would take our caliper and we would measure the head diameter. We would measure the length. And as long as you came up to like a 0.75 ratio, you kind of made this assumption before, you know, the, before the advent of solid models and all this other stuff that it shouldn't tilt in the hose past 30 degrees and we were a-okay to go. And you know what? For the screw on the left, that kind of works because look at that screw. It's got a, you know, it's a square, right? It's just a square block. And even the one in the center somewhat is, is square, right? That's what screws, screws used to look like back in the olden days. They don't look anything like that anymore, it seems like. I, don't, I can't remember the last time I had a regular, regular looking screw. Like if you were to look it up, if you were to Google, you know, what does a screw look like? This is what it looks like. What they look like is much different, which is in, in some of the slides coming up. But basically, the, the basic premise is you, you, the screw really shouldn't tilt any more than 30 degrees in the hose, or else it has the, the, the capability of twisting and getting stuck in there. And there's, there's other areas also. Now, when we talk about the hose, we also have to be aware of how big the hose has to be, the inside diameter of those ha hose has to be based on the screw size. So if a screw has an eight millimeter diameter head maximum, you can't put it through an eight millimeter tubing, it won't work. We would probably go up to a nine. So that's the first thing we have to figure out. So if the next slide kind of shows you what we get these days, that's more like what a screw looks like in today's world. And it gets worse from here. There's rubber washers and gaskets and split washers and everything on these screws these days. And so our industry has changed quite a bit to accommodate the more, um, complicated screw designs that our customers come up with. So this is a this is actually a cut sheet from um, a, a screw that we did recently. And you'll see some things that are actually critical to us. If you take a look at the overall length of the screw, which would be the 3.5 uh, plus or minus 0.2 and the 7.6 plus or minus um, 0.3, and you add to those together, you would say, hey, that's the overall length of the screw. And it kind of is, if you take it and you measure it, that's how long the screw is. But that's not really the effective area of the screw that we look at when we say, can this thing actually tilt? In fact, you can take that 3.5 in the red here and throw it in the garbage. It doesn't mean anything to us because that's never going to hit the hose. What we really have to look, look, look at is the 7.6 dimension at the bottom in yellow. Mm. And we say, okay, that's how long the shank is. And then I say, whoop, 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 not so fast. Look at what's in blue. There's an angle on it. And so the minimum shank diameter is really 3.6, and even that has a tolerance on it. So what we need to do is we calculate these things. So we actually put them, that we have a program um, that we've developed over time where we actually draw the screw up and using the tolerance, and we say, okay, at this screw, at its worst tolerance, will it be more or less than 30 degrees? And that's what allows us to make the determination whether we have to either we can blow feed it, which is always the best thing, if you ask me, or we have to go the expensive route. We just talked about that expensive hose in the SEK, or can, or do we have to pick and place it? And again, nothing against pick and place. Pick and place works great, right? But if I don't know what's on the next slide here. So if we were to do the math on this part here, just looking at it, you've got a 13.5 diameter of mm -hmm. this part with the washer. On That's right. It. And, yeah. and so even with this uh, area here, we're at 7.6. And if you take the you know, 1.2 into account, you're yeah. now down to 6.4. Yeah, so, it just gets worse. Yeah, so you're, this one's not gonna be fed through a tubing. Through, through That's a right. And tube, it, right, I mean, it's- Right, and what we're looking at, you say that the 13.5 head diameter isn't really, because look, there's a minus tolerance on that. So we have to use that. We have to, we have to always assume like a legal binding contract is that screw has to blow feed. That's what we have to tell them the customer can do. And I have to assume that they're allowed to use that whole tolerance. Sure. So I have to say it's 13 and a half minus 0.35. So that's really my dimension. Here's an actual screw. This is actually interesting. This is I've scribbled up the, the, the names of, of the customer to protect the innocent here. But you see that red line? That's what we're really, really looking for. We're not looking at the overall length. We're not looking at the shank length. We're looking at what word is it is worst case scenario. And that red line falls under 30 degrees. So that screw has to be either pick and placed or it has to go through profile to me. 
Mm. And uh, this is kind of where this is all going here. Um, I think the next slide shows, uh, here we are. Okay, so the, the screw on the right is the customer screw. That's literally that 210. The screw on the left at 270, 60 thousandths longer can be blow fed. That's all he was. If you take your business card and you fold it in half, and then you fold it in half again, and you measure it with a caliper, that's how close this guy was from having a, uh, a pick and place or a uh, profile tube machine rather than a blow feed machine. And like I say all the time, if I had a dollar for every time I heard, if I would known then what I know now, I would have done something different. So if you take a look at that screw, that's 210. There's a couple things you can do. The obvious thing is just add 60 to the length of it and off you go, right? He could have also, and let's say, let's say you can't do that. Let's say, listen, 210 is as long as I can make the screw because if I drill the hole any deeper, I'm going to break into the journal and I'm going to get oil all over the place, whatever this thing is. Okay, well, you can make the head height taller. And so that way you have the same effective thread length, mm. but the head height is taller and head height is taller. And now I can blow feed it. Now I'm into the less expensive, faster machine. This exact customer needed to drive a screw in sub two seconds. They needed a cycle time of 1.5 seconds to put that screw in. There was absolutely no way that he was gonna do this with a pick in place. Right. He ended up buying an, S an S SEK, which is fine, it's fine. But in fact, he needed two of them because there was two of these screws that were very, very close to one another. And that wouldn't even have worked with a pick in place because you can't get two pick in places that close together. The spindles we were. And so he has a feed system, a single feed system with a diverter that the diverter goes back and forth. It sends a screw to sp spindle number one. It sends a screw to spindle number two. And they both come in, they drive. This was a dial machine. So it was very, very yeah. fast. Usually dial machines, you know, represent things that have to happen very quickly. So um, again, we had a solution for him. No problem at all. But when we got into it, and when you take these things apart and you start servicing them and you're looking at the cost of ownership, you're like, man, I really, really wish I could have just taken my business card, folded it over twice and got there with that length. I would have been a lot better off. So these are what some I, of the conversations. What I, appreciate, what I appreciate about what you're saying, Michael, is, is clearly this is a solution that Weber has. And mm -hmm. it's something that, that you do all of the time. But what you're trying to do is to help the customer help themselves by saving them money. You're, you're happy to build the system for them, but there is unnecessary complexity and cost of ownership that goes along with it. And you, you, wanna, you genuinely uh, wanna save them money in, in time. Absolutely, absolutely. Because the, the, the more success they have with our equipment, the happier they are, the, the more that we're, we're viewed as, as, a, as a valued supplier a solution solve, you know, solution uh, provider to them. And that's, that's really what we're looking, looking at. Like I said before, you know, we really want to become partners with, with our, with our customers the best that we can. And again, you don't always get invited to the party, but when you do, it's actually, it's kind of nice to, to let them know what it is that you're thinking. This reminds me of, of a story and it, hopefully this won't take too long here. I'll be quick. Um, we have a big, we have a, a customer, a big customer uh, buys a ton of stuff from us. And they, all I'll tell you is that they make plastic parts and every year the plastic parts are a little bit different and they have different shapes and that sort of thing. And we have a great relationship with this customer. Um, I know the engineering manager very, very well. And I know, uh, I know the, the maintenance manager and all, this, all the technicians that work through that plant very well. We have a great relationship. They all got my cell phone number. They call me all hours of the day and night questions. It's awesome. But um, the engineering manager is like, man, these guys are killing me. Like we have to get different types of machines for all these different designs are coming up with. I said, you know what, let's do this. This is one of my favorite things to do. I said, let's do a lunch and learn. We'll come in, we'll bring, we get sandwiches and potato chips and soda. Just give me like an hour and a half with your engineering team. He goes, hey, we can do that. So um, one of the complications for this customer is that the engineering group is in one building and the manufacturing group is like an hour and a half away. That's where the plant is, right? So these guys really don't get to see real life usually unless they like trek over to the plant and usually it's not for a good reason to see what's going on there. So we wanted to kind of bridge that gap and tie this together. So I go out there and I got my whole toolbox. I got different nose pieces and vacuum tubes and samples and I got a whiteboard and I'm drawing screws and stuff. And a lot of the equipment that these guys buy um, has to be vacuum 
held. In other words, not pick in place, but we do also the auto feed stuff in a, in a way that we can get in deep, deep recesses with, with vacuum, which is a whole nother CapEx thing we can do someday. And that's, they have a ton of these things. And uh, I'm going through, we're showing them about how screws are, you know, what, what, the, this, what we just talked about, the length of diameter ratio and, and how their parts fit together. And if they were to just put datum points on stuff so we can actually locate the parts better and how to fixture the parts and all that stuff. And um, I'm going through this with these guys. And I said, I don't know why it came to me. I said, like, you know what? I have another customer that does equipment just like they, they build parts just like you guys do. And we've been working with them even longer than we've been working with you guys. And they've narrowed their scope down. There's like, they have like three screws. They have like screw A, B, and C. And their engineers were told, when you design a part, try as hard as you can to use this screw, this screw, or that screw. If you have to use a different kind of screw for this, you either need to really have a really, really good reason why, or, you have to redesign the part so you can use one of these three screws. And it was funny. They're all sitting there and they're eating, you know, they're eating their sandwiches and whatnot. It was almost like watching a cartoon. I'm looking at over the crowd. It was like 25 people in this room. And it was like, you know, in the cartoons with like a light bulb goes off over someone's head and like, and they start looking at each other. And I see these light bulbs going off and they're like, really? Because what was happening is these guys were given free reign. And every time they designed something, they'd get the screw guy in. The screw would be like, oh, you need this kind of screw. And they'd sell them a different screw. So these guys, they had like a they had like a million different screws. Like every machine ran a different screw. But the parts are all kind of the same, right? So there's this one light bulb that goes off in the back of the room. It's a little brighter than the rest of the bulbs. And that bulb is starting to walk towards me. And that is the engineering manager, the guy who invited me there in the first place. And he gets up and he's like, did you hear what he just said? Why do we use so many different screws? Why is it? And, and you know, they didn't, it wasn't their fault. They were allowed to do it and they didn't know any better. He goes, that's it. We're going to put a focus group together. We're going to get, we're going to narrow this down. You guys can use a couple of screws, but you can't come up with a different screw every time you design something. Nonetheless, the, 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 um, the scale of, of, of quantity when you buy the things, you know, you're sure. buying 10,000 screws a week for one product is one thing buying 22,000 of, of the same thing. You get a lot more leverage with your suppliers to get that. And the spare parts, every machine had a different hose size, a different vacuum tube size, different tooling size and driving the, the technicians nuts because they're all different. I said, you know, how about, why don't you just pick Torx 15, 20 and 25 and that's it. If it doesn't fit, then you got to redesign the part because then they got 19 different bits Sure. One's, one's a Torx, one's a Torx IP, and then they're getting cross-germinated in the feeders and they're driving everyone crazy. And it wasn't really until I brought that up that they really realized what they were doing. Something as simple as that could save that company a ton of money and a ton of um, heartache, keeping all different parts for all the different machines. And um, again, it was no one's fault. They just, you know, they were kind of just giving free reign. Everyone's sitting in their cubicle, driving their mouse, designing parts. I'm like, okay, I got a hole. I got to put a screw in it and let me call the, and the screw suppliers happy. You know, he's sure, coming and selling for sure. different, different SKU number every week for something else. And some of the screws were so close, they would get cross germinated in the feeders and jam and they get the wrong screw and the wrong part. And they were so close, you oh, can hardly yeah. tell them apart. So it was driving them nuts. So the engineering manager kind of, yeah, he, he sat back and was like, yeah, I kind of kind of let, let this happen. I didn't realize, you know, what the impact would be. It, you don't notice when you have like three Weber screwdrivers, but when you have like a hundred of them, it starts to make a big impact, you know, and it happens quickly. So anyway, that's, that's just, that's one of many stories we can tell about trying to try to help our customers um, get to where they need to be in the most efficient way. And again, you know, there's, <laughs> I've coined the phrase, there is just because you can doesn't mean you should, right? And that is sometimes referring to just because you can design a part a certain way doesn't mean it's the best for everyone. Maybe it gets it off your desk, but then it becomes someone else's problem. Sure. Um, I, I remember doing a service call probably, you know, probably at least 25 years ago, it was at a Japanese manufacturer that built alternators and the parts just fit together. Great. Like it was a good quality part. Like you just put the halves together and everything would fit together and date them together. And the screws were, they were complicated screws because they had washers on them and stuff, but they were good quality screws. Like you could see the fit finish. When you looked at the blueprints, it was tolerancing called out really well and stuff. 
I was like, this is really nice stuff. And, and the manufacturing engineer goes, you know what? We have a policy here. He goes, if you're going to be a product designer, you need, you need to do, go through manufacturing engineering first, which means put someone else's stuff together, see what's important for you know, all those lessons learned about the design for manufacturing, and then you can design a part for us. Sure. But until you sure. learn how to put stuff together, and I thought that was like the most, that was the most incredible thing. I was like, why wouldn't everyone do that? I know it's not always possible. Now, the polarizing side of that today in 2020, 2021 is a lot of these newer companies that are coming up, and I would say particularly the EV companies that are taking designs right off the drawing board and they're just ramming them through. If, if I've gotten one, I've gotten five requests for quote from this, this market, and they're sending you drawings from McMaster car on the screw, which they're not going to buy the screws from McMaster car, but that's like their source for getting screws. And so sure. what we're doing is we're getting involved with these customers saying, you know, there's a screw that you don't even have tolerancing on. Um, McMaster car goes to whatever supplier du jour that's the cheapest. They're never probably going to, you never again, probably going to get the same box of screws twice. I mean, they'll fit the build quarter 20 and that's it but they're not really going to be that accurate and repeatable. Let us help you. And we'll, we'll help them shop around for a screw. We don't recommend screws. In other words, we're not going to say you have to use this screw, but we will give them some ideas on what are some of the key factors on the screws so that they can be successful. And, and when we're invited to the party early enough, which is a little bit what this, is, which this whole thing is about, we really like to leverage our knowledge in that way for our customers. Sure. Well, let's, uh, let's next time. Uh, we will have a conversation about uh, screw, sc the configuration of the screws that, yeah. that uh, feed the best, that torque the best, and, yeah. and we, can, we can have that conversation. But you know, we are really yeah. grateful for you taking the time, Michael, to join us today. Uh, Weber Screw Driving, uh, great company, great facility up there in Mooresville, North Carolina. Uh, they know their stuff. They are uh, true pros uh, in the business. Uh, so again, we are CapEx Sales, so grateful for the opportunity to serve our customers uh, day in and day out. And, and uh, we just want to be adding value however we can. That's why we, we do this industry cast. We actually, we, we, don't, uh, we don't represent Weber. Um, we just have established a relationship with them and, and they were kind enough to hop on this call and, and share their expertise. So again, Michael, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Take care. See you, everybody. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.